This is Vanessa Van Alstein, and welcome to the podcast, Art, I Swear. Today's podcast was requested by an artist named Jen Silva. Her and her husband own a comic company. If you like to check out some neat science-based comics or maybe connect with some fun artists. So, like I said, Jen suggested the topic, and the topic is a sculptor named Louise Nevelson. If you like the quick and dirty on Louise Nevelson, she was born in Kiev, Russia in 1888, died in the United States in the 1980s, and she was a sculptor who mostly worked with found wood objects. da 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 that's all, folks. I'm going to give a little bit of a warning. Louise Nevelson was a colorful person, and there's going to be a couple of quotes of hers I use that have the F-bomb in them. So if you're real sensitive to curse words, you might turn away. So I want to talk about Louise Nevelson's early life when we're discussing her, because she is born a Jewish woman in what is a very volatile time and place for Jewish people. Kiev it's Russia when she's born, it's the Ukraine now, and it is a center uh, for Jewish culture and thought in that in Eastern Europe at the time. There is a large number of Jewish people in the city, and as things in Russia get a little more dicey with the czars and later the communists, the the Jewish people in Kiev start to move their family from Russia into Kiev and make it an even bigger center. And just like what happened in Germany and has happened all over the world in Europe, because man, as much as we want to think Europeans are enlightened and progressive and so much better than us people from the United States, the reality is there's anti-Semitism has a strong history. Uh, Hating the Romani or gypsies or whatever you want to call them has a strong history. And usually they have a neighbor that they just can't stand this isn't everybody, of course, but let's let's not pretend like the United States invented bigotry or racism, okay? As the Jewish people start to develop a more prominent economic center in Kiev, like I said, just like what happens in Germany in the 40s, 30s and 40s, <laughs> they people get jealous. They see this culture that's come together really out of necessity because they're so discriminated against and see the influence and power they've created once again out of necessity and sometimes to serve weird European cultural norms because if you won't do something, somebody's going to step in and do what you won't do. So this anti-Semitism actually causes some pogroms. The first ones happen in the 1880s. The next one occurs in 1905, and that's around the time she leaves Kiev. Now, I don't know if she was really exposed to that pogrom. The reality is, though, she was in a volatile atmosphere that made it to where leaving her home country had been ideal to her relatives for generations, and they're now worried enough they're sponsoring her large family to get out of their native country. And her father passes during this time. He's not able to go to the United States with her. And this actually traumatizes Louise quite a bit. And her last name isn't Nevelson at this point. It's a Russian name that I'm I'm not going to be able to pronounce right. I'm not even going to try. You can look it up. Mad respects to the Russians and Ukrainians, especially because y'all are the, like, mad hackers of the world. Oh my god, please don't get mad at me. I just uh, don't want to dishonor your culture by my clumsy pronunciation. There's some stories that after her father's death, she actually doesn't talk for six months. That's disputed. What is known is the family relocates to Bristol, Maine. And even in modern day, Bristol, Maine is not a thriving metropolitan hub by any stretch of the means. I, I think the largest city in Maine doesn't even have a million people. And, you know, mad props to people from Maine. I've got some really good friends from there. So Louise Nevelson never likes living in this small Maine city, being, you know, kind of a rural girl. And... Despite being around people from her culture, and she always embraces her culture, going through that kind of trauma, um, it's going to make you closer to your group of people. Not that it's bad to stay close. Um, I'm just specifying that she doesn't wander away from her faith like Mondrian did, like a lot of artists do. But she, she always stays connected to her Jewish heritage and is very supportive of it even more so after things go wrong in the 30s and 40s. This is also to say she graduates high school in 1918. So I want to specify that she 
she's a little bit older than some people who are going to make it when she makes it. So just keep that in the back of your head. And in 1918, she gets out of Maine. She goes and meets a wealthy industrialist named Charles Nevelson. They get married shortly after she provides him a son. And she spends 11 years playing the role of the good high society Jewish wife and hates every minute of it. I, She's just not happy with who her husband wants her to be. She spends a lot of money. He doesn't like that. He's constantly on her back. She's still trying to create artwork, which isn't seen as an appropriate hobby for a wealthy industrialist's wife. Um, and those two just butt heads a lot. She's also, I, well, I, I have no doubt she loved her son. I, I don't think anybody would argue that she was really the best mother. She's there for Mike, but... In the 30s, her and her mother agree that she's just miserable, divorce is okay, and she sells a bracelet that her husband gave her that was made out of diamonds so that she can take off to Paris and Germany to learn art with the Cubists, who are not really the cutting edge of art at this point, but that's, we're just... I guess I'm trying to say that cubism is not at its height at this point. So it's a little weird that she's so fixated on it. But Louise Nevelson is, if you can't tell, not a fan of convention. And her mother keeps her son for a number of years. Eventually his father ends up with custody and they kind of do this back and forth. It's almost like, you know, the nasty 80s marriages that I feel like kids my age grew up with just a whole lot earlier and when it was not seen as appropriate at all. And that's one of the areas where you probably could criticize Louise Nevelson. She does give her son work. And as they get older, they kind of make up and have a little bit better of a relationship. And some of this I'm basing on a book that was supposed to be an official biography approved by her. She died during the creation and had pulled out her approval. I'll link to it in the show notes if you want to check out the book. But, you know, anything you're hearing from other sources, grain of salt... Louise Nevelson ends up studying with Cubists in Germany during the 30s and 40s. And you can all probably guess where this is going. It's not only extremely dangerous to be an abstract artist in Germany during this period, being a Jewish abstract artist, she just has to get out. She gets out with all of the other people from like the ball house and stuff and ends up back in New York city. What she's accomplishing at this point is she's a very gifted muralist. She actually teaches uh, mural painting uh, for the WAP during world war II, And she still is making sculpture, a lot of found object work. And when I say found object, there's an artist you probably want to Google named Joseph Cornell. He's who invents those words and it's taking items Everyday items from newspapers, from the street, from trash, from advertising, from wherever you find them, and recontextualizing them together. And recontextualizing means that what they symbolize and what they stand for is new. Recontextualization is a word I will use again when we talk about contemporary art because it becomes very important in postmodernism. But back here with the modernist, it's still going on. The trick with Nevelson at this point is she has not hit her stride. She's very, very poor, not doing very well. One of the interesting people she studies with around this time is Diego Rivera. And she finds a kinship with the, you know, left-leaning communist sorts from Mexico. And it's widely understood that she has an affair with Diego Rivera. She never confirmed this. Frida Kahlo never really confirmed this. I I do know there's some, I've read some writings from Nevelson where she did not approve of Frida, Frida Kahlo. She kind of saw her as Diego's little pet puppy. And she has this discussion about how she lovingly lights a cigar for him and places it in his mouth. And Nevelson doesn't see this as loving. She sees it as disgusting. She does not get how you can just be a slave to a man like that. And I feel like that tells you a lot about Louise Nevelson because she never actually remarries, but she has this string of affairs 
They're people she admires. They're people she's interested in. They're people that run galleries she wants to get into. And there's always this level of like academic or intellectual curiosity along with her love affairs. But she does also admit that the secret to a woman becoming a successful artist in a period where women were really looked down upon as having girl brains is fucking. She says flat out the secret to living a life of luxury and, you know, getting where you want to go is to have sex. Now, don't think I'm slut shaming Louise Nevelson. I'm just being very honest about this because I feel like it's part of her charisma. If she were a dude during this time, I really think she'd have been seen as like your international um, playboy sort, especially with the uh, love of wealthy clothing that she has. Her persona, especially as she gets older, becomes its own art in a way. It becomes tied up in the things she creates. I feel like a lot like what Andy Warhol did. I like to think of Andy Warhol as a rock star before rock stars were cool. Kind of took that like rebel attitude and turned it into a fine art. And Nevelson is kind of doing the same thing, but she's a sexually liberated woman in a time when that's sketch at the very best um i salute her for it you know what i'm you know have sex with other consenting adults that's okay with me use protection you're the parents if parents are listening to this they're probably covering their children's ears and screaming but you know what you need to you need to tell your kids that or you'll end up with grandkids anyways and one of the hard things about nevelson is you'll notice we've talked about a significant period of her life and her artwork doesn't really start to take off until the 1950s. So she's, she's, she's an older lady. And honestly, most artists, they hit their stride in their 40s or 50s. So a little bit younger than she does. But she is struggling on a starvation level until she's an old woman. It's almost like the word no just makes this woman more determined. And you kind of have to admire that. The first show that starts to really make her a breakthrough is at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And that's usually abbreviated MoMA, M-O-M-A. So if I ever say MoMA, that's what I mean. And the shows start to pick up from there. She's in the Venice Benali, which is kind of like getting a Grammy for the art world. It, there's these big art fairs. And if you're part of them, it's a really big deal and it can make or break you. But it isn't really until the 60s, 70s, and 80s, like the last 30 years of her life, that she becomes this big deal. Her work in the 50s that starts to get her noticed are these flat black sculptures that have pieces carved into them. They're what we would call a relief. And it's in the 50s when she starts to take these components off of the streets, out of the trash from her fire stack, um, from industrial sites and combine these wood pieces inside boxes and then stack the boxes. I said in the Mondrian podcast that she was part of his studio life and spoke with him quite a bit and that he has this huge influence on her, partly to organize herself. And another one is to look at the rhythm of geometrics. And I feel like that's, that's a strong influence here. She's always worked heavily in geometrics. I don't want you to feel like she just steals this from Mondrian. But looking at him and looking at these other heavily abstracted guys from Europe that she both studied with in Europe and are now meeting in New York because they fled Nazi Germany, it really, it has this impact on her and her work becomes a lot tighter and a lot better. And that's what good art education should do for people. Some of these assemblages, these large found object works are wall pieces that hang Others, especially, like I said, towards the end of her life, become these large, looming castles. And some of them are called castles. They all have this, like, naming convention that's kind of ethereal and from the heavens. And I would like to read you a poem she wrote for one of her shows during this period that I feel like I've always loved it, so that's why I want to share it. Queen of the Black Black. In the valley of all, all, with one glance sees the king, mountain top, the climb, the way, restless winds, midnight blooms, tons, 
tons of colors, tones of water drops, crystal reflections, painting mirages, celestial splendor, highest grandeur, queen of the black black, king of the all all. And this was written in 1961. Is almost kind of a peer of the abstract expressionist like Jackson Pollock. She's shown with the early pre-fathers of pop art like Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns and is a strong peer of the pop movement, of the minimalist movement. And she kind of reflects all of these things with pop art being heavily dependent upon commercial media. She's using cornices from houses. She's using trash. She's using chair legs. She's using things that you can readily identify. But at the same time, everything she does has a flat color palette. She very early embraces spray paint so that her things have this like very slick matte figure. There's one piece I know about that's a very dark purple. Otherwise, they're mostly black or white. And that white a lot of times has turned to cream with age. That's just something especially early white paints do. There's also gold and silver pieces. And these large box pictures are really when somebody says Louise Nevelson, what they're thinking about. Towards the end of her life, she begins to experiment with public art. And I could get in an argument here with the difference between the word public art and graffiti. Basically, public art is accepted art pieces that are installed in a site and understood to be made by people of value. We tend to not value self-trained artists like graffiti artists. That's another podcast. Anyways, and with these public works, she has to start examining media that is not wood. So she starts experimenting in foundry uh, made steel pieces, uh, plexiglass. She loves plexiglass. She's a big fan of embracing the future and seeing how things can change. And I couldn't find great photos of any of her plexiglass pieces. There's, I'm sure a lot of you people who listen to YouTube a lot are aware of how weird copyright is and institutions want to make money off of their copyrighted media. So without paying hundreds of dollars so that I can use one image in this podcast, I wasn't able to pull those. But that said, you might search them. They're very interesting. I feel like they have a dialogue once again with the earlier people that she's been looking at. I would point out Maholi Nagy from the Ball House in specific. And it's in the 1980s that she passes away. So she lives to be in her 90s. And like I said, that persona of her in her later years is this old woman with scarves and ridiculously long eyelashes and furs. And she loves photographers. There's tons of pictures of her with her artwork. And uh, Robert Maplethorpe, who's a very famous photographer that sadly died very young, um, takes these great pictures of her where she's almost this like, haunting art skull from the beyond like I I don't like to focus on women's appearances that much because I feel like in a way that demeans their value but with Louise Nevelson she was so dedicated to her presentation when you see works like Nevelson's which is very rhythmic which is these pieces that are interestingly contained in these capsules and if you think about her life there are these encapsulated periods. She's a refugee from Russia. She's a small town girl in Maine. She's a wealthy industrialist wife. She's a struggling artist. She's a successful artist. It's almost like the rhythm of these pieces and all those little shrapnels and fragments and tiny muted elements say a lot about how she's experienced her life. It's all these little pieces in these little boxes. And I do you think a lot of her work had influence on design, especially in the 1970s and early 80s? Like, it was the shiznizzle. To take old printing press letter trays, because those are becoming obsolete with digital printing, and put little figurines in them. I, I, I really, that's a lot of her work uses, like, letter trays and wood pieces like that. So I, I kind of think it's a nod to Nevelson. But with this kind of artist, you tend to hear the words... My five-year-old can make that. And I find this extremely funny because I found a bunch of images while I'm looking at her of early art school people or children 
uh, learning about her in art history and then recreating work like hers. And it's terrible. Like, I did not... Okay, I maybe found a few that were very well done, but for the most part, it's just ridiculously bad. And I think part of it is you have to look at how methodical her gallery, or how methodical her studio practice was. Studio is the right word there. She had this studio that looked like chaos, but all of the little bits and pieces she used were set into these like cubbies and crevices. And she would pull them out, arrange them, rearrange them, rethink a lot like Mondrian would tape and retape and think. All of it is very well thought out. She doesn't just throw things in these boxes. She does work on multiple pieces at once, and that's part of why this work is really prolific. But there's a lot of design that goes into it as well. This isn't something that's just pulled out of the air. This is something that's deliberate, well thought out, and I actually challenge you to do better. If you can rip off a Nevelson to the point that I can't tell, show it to me and then please destroy it because you don't want to be that person that rips off artists. Ah! Our intro and outro is created by a New York City DJ named Joe Giggs. If you're looking for some fun rhythmic DJ ness, check out Joe Giggs. Also, the intro and outro were samples from the Conant Project by Iridial. Check out our show notes for more information and have a creative day. Also, don't forget to like or share. We're also on Facebook. Oh my gosh, tell your friends. Art history. Yay.